<laughs> Welcome everybody to the third um, budget workshop on March 5th. Um, with all other um, workshops, I'm handing over the gavel to Elizabeth, Circus of Finance Chair. I'm heady with power. <laughs> Uh, good evening and welcome to the third of five planned budget workshops. The budget review schedule is available here tonight in hard copy as well as on the school district website. Just click on the budget link at the top of the home page and I did that today just to make sure and everything seems to be working. All budget workshops are open to the public, recorded and posted online with public comment welcome. With regard to public comment and the agenda, <coughs> The Cape Elizabeth School Department takes very seriously its responsibility for approving a budget that is both educationally and fiscally responsible. The budget for any large organization has many components, which in the case of a school system often generates strong feelings amongst the community. In order to have a sound budget that the community can support, the board must be able to hear the views of community members and town officials as well as have the time to consider the detailed expert advice of school administrators and deliberate amongst board members. To accomplish this goal, the board will be following a structured agenda for each budget discussion. The structure is designed to provide full and clear information to all. Allow each person who wishes to contribute to the discussion an opportunity to do so and give the board ample opportunity to deliberate and come to reasonable decisions. The agenda for budget discussions will be as follows. Number one, there will be a sign-up sheet for members of the public who wish to speak on the budget that evening. It's at the podium. The public will be invited to ask questions at the beginning and end of the meeting. There will be a time limit of three minutes per person. Speakers are encouraged to submit any detailed comments in writing so they can be fully considered by all board members, including those who may be absent that evening. However, it is fine to speak without having a written comment. Number two, board members will raise their hands and be recognized for the purpose of asking questions or making comments. Board members will be recognized in the order in which they raise their hands, <coughs> if we can keep up with everybody. All board members shall have the opportunity to be heard. <clears throat> Number three, once all board member questions are answered, <coughs> members of the public will be again invited to speak. Questions and comments may be received by myself or Susanna via email as well. Just go to the town or school department website, navigate to the school board section, and click on an email link to send your thoughts to us. As I do at every school board uh, budget workshop, I'd like to remind everybody of the goals that we are using as we develop this budget. Number one, maintaining and improving the high quality of education for every student. Number two, careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness <coughs> of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Number three, clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. We will hold these goals in mind as we examine each cost center, each department, each school, and each program. <coughs> when decisions need to be made, we will weigh them against these goals. Thus far, we have been given a big picture view of all the pieces of our school department and how the parts work together to provide an excellent educational experience for our students. We have gotten an ED279 state funding update as well as an overview of the school board budget binders. We have heard from the Ponco Playground Fundraising Group with regard to their efforts and plans. Also, administrators and department heads have begun to respond to previously submitted budget questions and comments. At the conclusion of la our last evening, the board began discussion about giving direction to the superintendent with regards to spending reductions and cost savings. That will lead to an updated version of the budget. Tonight, we will hear a proposal concerning our school department website from Superintendent Wolfram. Continue with answers to previously submitted questions to administrators and department heads. Have further discussion on staffing and enrollment. Hear about government mandates that directly impact how and why we staff our schools the way we do. And possibly give further direction to the superintendent regarding reductions to the spending increases. Before our first presentation, I'd like to open the floor to any members of the public that wish to speak. Please step up to the podium and introduce yourself, and please remember to sign the sheet provided. Nobody eager to be at the podium tonight? Maybe. 
Okay. Well, that concludes that part of the evening. Um, we can move on to a website proposal from Dr. Wolfram. So in your packets, um, you have uh, the proposal sheet. We have been receiving comments regarding the website, um, and several members of the board have researched the possibility of hiring a website designer. A uh, website company to design a website that would meet the needs of the current and incoming citizens of the district. So I am recommending that um, $15,000 be added to the FY20 budget for a desi design of the new website. And again, you, um, in your packet, um, you have the proposal sheet, and so you should put that in your uh, budget books under the proposals. <laughs> So we will be uh, researching that and wanted to um, put some funds in the budget uh, so we could move forward with that. Would you like um, any members of the board that have been in any of these meetings to give any background to that discussion at this time or would you like to wait for another time? If you'd like to. Um Okay, I will. <laughs> um, so we, we've been talking about uh, working on our school website now for, for at least a couple of years um, that I'm aware of, if not longer. And um, as, as uh, in terms of a marketing tool, it's the first place that anybody from out of town um, looks, goes to first. And if anybody is familiar with our website, it can be frustrating. It can take more than um, too many clicks to get to where you need to, and sometimes you end up going to the town website. Um, <clears throat> and there's definitely a way to make the whole process uh, slicker and um, more um, on the level of our district. So we've looked into um, a couple of um, companies that focus strictly on d designing and hosting uh, school websites. Um, so there's generally two costs. One is the, um, de the design of the website and um, uploading it to the, to the internet and then the annual hosting, um, the content management service provider. So th they're the ones who um, monitor if there's any issues um, on a 24-7 basis. They are responsible for securing all content on, on the it, website um, and also responsible for providing um, tutorials or any needed um, onboarding for future or current um, staff members so that they can have um, access to uploading their department's information. So we're looking at two costs basically. One for design and implementation, and then one for an annual reoccurring hosting fee. And does the 15,000 um, requested cover both parts, the maintenance? Well, um, it, it, it might, it might. Um, I think this is sort of a ballpark figure. Um, one company in particular said they were willing to um, stretch out the cost of the design over maybe two years. Um, so 15,000, if they are true to their word, would be enough for one company. Another company, um, their hosting is less, but their design um, structure and building is, is higher. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good estimate um, for a first, first run, um, but one company would be spread out over two years. And another one, we're not sure exactly. I, I haven't pursued an RFP yet. Um, we just wanted to put it in the budget and see how people felt about it first. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Any further discussion on this topic at this time? Okay, seeing none, moving on to, um, we'd like to continue with our um, question and answer session, and I believe we left off at special education. Good evening. Del Peavy, special services director. So um, 
I, the first question, to back up a little bit and give some background, when I presented uh, my initial proposals from the budget, I was essentially looking at just preserving what we have in place now um, with the, of course, the increased cost in salaries and benefits. And when you look, went down through those lines, I had to give you guys some explanation why there was some big increases. And so that's when it was obvious that there had been some errors in the previous budget. And so the, this first question is, thank you for explaining the many previous miscategorizations, errors, and subsequent corrections needed upon your arrival in our school department. We need to know how this happened and be able to show that the source of the problem has been addressed. Well, I, I can't necessarily speak to what happened prior to my arrival, but I do want the board to be assured that uh, there are procedures in place now to ensure that it doesn't happen going forward. Um, I meet on a regular base, basis with Catherine, as well as uh, Donna has taken an active role in the, the budget as well. So we are um, ensuring, and I've had, uh, I've asked Catherine for additional breakdowns or breakouts of the budget so I know exactly what's on each line and who's on each line. Uh, do I feel confident the lines of the spe special ed budget are now reflected correctly and accurately? I do. And the only other question that you folks had for me was, do we have any positions or programs in this bu budget that are currently grant funded but will have to be moved into the school department funded realm in the near future? And the answer is no. And uh, do you folks have any other questions for me? Any further questions? Thank you. All right. Moving on to facilities and transportation. Good evening. I wish my list was as short. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go through this kind of quickly, but um, you know, don't don't hesitate to stop me if, if you have got questions on something. Uh, the middle school generator is the one we'll start off with. It is my understanding that internet connectivity for all town hall offices originates at the middle school. It follows then that any time the middle school Pond Cove school structures loses power, all town hall offices do not have access to the internet. Given that a generator for the Pond Cove middle school structure will benefit town hall greatly as well, will you please approach the town manager and town council chair about sharing the cost of the generator. What is the financial cost to the school and town every time we lose power at Pond Cove, at, at Pond Cove and the middle school? And please talk about what happened last school year when Pond Cove was down for an extended period of time more than once. Um, I actually had to go to Noel for a little bit of background on how the uh, network is configured, but for the most part, the, the, the network shares the same telephone pole as where our electric comes in, and that's right across the street from the middle school playground. The both electric and internet come in through that that one area of location and comes into the middle school and from there branches out. So when the middle school and Pond Cove are without power, even though we have a generator at the high school, the high school is also now without internet connection. I'm also being told that it affects the town library and yes, it affects the entire town hall building as far as internet connectivity as well. And we will be meeting with the town manager and, and discussing that further um, in the upcoming days. Uh, as far as how it affects the school, I mean, it, for the most part, you know, in the winter, winter time, it's pretty obvious that we are at risk of, of freezing pipes and things like that. And given that we have rooftop units that the only thing that separates the pipes from the outside air is a metal flap. 
So once once the hot water has cooled off and become to a freezing temperature, it's we're in trouble at that point. And in the warmer the warmer season, the threat is more of the walk-in coolers and the amount of food that we have stored in the freezers and the refrigerators. Um, I think we did have a little bit of a loss last year. Luckily, it wasn't uh, the refrigerator and freezer were not fully stocked. But the smaller, the, the, the walk-in freezer and refrigerator actually held its temperature. What, where we ran into the problem is the smaller refrigerators and uh, things that they can store ice cream in and things like that, those warmed up quicker. Um, moving on to the next question, please explain how you, choose, how you chose the site for the Pond Cove Middle School Generator. What factors drove that decision? Are there models of generators that are more environmentally friendly than others? The location was picked solely on, uh, when you drive into the middle school, you'll see right by the baseball field, there is a transformer. Directly across from that transformer is a set of doors and that's the electrical room. The, the easiest and least expensive way to then put in the generator is in between those two items so that when the power comes right out of the transformer, goes right into the generator and then into the building. And that's the only reason why that location was picked. Um, I do feel that if we wanted to address the aesthetics of the building down the road, we could do a fence around it or some shrubbery or something to help make it look a little more pleasing to the eye. Um, we have looked into other, other style of generators. There's natural gas and propane. Unfortunately, the, the one that could probably provide the most power um, and not, not be diesel would be the natural gas. Unfortunately, we don't have natural gas in Cape Elizabeth. If we were to do a propane style generator for that size of the building, they figure about three generators it would take to power that. You just get more horsepower, therefore more generation from a diesel engine than you do a propane driven engine. So that, that was the reason why behind going uh, with the diesel. And also having said that, they don't run, you know, it only runs when we have a power outage. And I believe it's once a week, it'll run for an hour, just in a self, just to make sure everything's working properly. If, it, if they don't run, it alarms the office to let us know that something had happened and it is not starting. Okay, on the Gator utility vehicle. Is the Gator that needs replacing also a possibility for shared funding by the town? Is that a new vehicle price or fixing existing one? If we're replacing the existing one, what is the existing vehicle value? Uh, the price is for a brand new um, style gator. I should have brought, actually brought the paperwork. I could have given you um, what we're actually looking at doing. Uh, it's actually a little different than the current one we have where the current one is an open concept. Where, so when you're riding on it and uh, in the, you're basically in the elements and uh, I, I know Jeff has de dealt with some issues with rain and cold weather, uh, so we decided to go with something with a little bit of a roof on top of it and a windshield. Um, as far as the existing one, we were not planning on, on trading that in. It, it, it is an option to, to decrease costs. It, we, we both feel that it wouldn't be valued at that much a couple hundred dollars due to its current condition and the fact that every so often you actually have to push it to get it going. So, you know, we, we had discussed it and talked about just hanging on to it until it doesn't go anymore and then we'll get rid of it some other way. Um, as far as going for the town, um, the, I actually don't even know that the town uses it, but if they do, it's, it's very, very limited. And they do provide us a space in the community center where it, the current one is stored. And that would be also the space we'd be looking to use for the newer one. Page two, middle school roof. What is the total square foot of the roof? Does the whole roof need to be repaired or replaced? How confident are you that you planned roofing, <laughs> that you planned roof, roofing slash building repair will fix the infamous sixth grade leak? Uh, the total square footage right now is not known. Um, 
due to uh, plans for that age of building are very limited. Uh, so we don't know, I did, I did receive a quote and, and the, the contractor, I just haven't had gotten the information from him. He has gone up and measured. But anyway, uh, that is actually the price for a two-phase project. The, the, the price that I'm using is to actually tear the shingles off, re-shingle it, and use step flashing along the walls. The second part of the project would be for the parapet walls that are on either side of the roof that extend up about three feet on either side. Those would get covered with a metal side that currently have a rubber on them. Uh, we believe there is moisture getting trapped behind that rubber. And uh, so that would be the second phase. The total project to redo that roof to 100% guarantee it would be about $90,000. So I'm, I'm looking to start a phase one this year and, and maybe pursue that other portion next year. Um, bonds, I actually had to go to Catherine for this one. Um, please provide context on the two bonds, 8310 and 8320, still outstanding. What were they for? When did they start? And when will they be paid off? The uh, That's the principal payment for um, apparent renovation that was done at the high school and the DOE requires that we separate the payments and principal interest uh, into se two separate line items. So that's what that actually is. It's, it's money that will be, be spent by the end of the year. It's just, we have to give it its own line. Pond Cove Playground, I think we covered that pretty much yesterday or uh, last week. I am meeting with them on Thursday morning to discuss further as far as the equipment. When we, when we finalize the equipment and what we're actually looking, then we'll have a solid price. It, it's really the equipment that's driving <coughs> the cost of the playground. Bus radios. What does it cost for bus radios? Have you tested these radios if they work in all areas or test them in areas where the cell phone does not work. Has Wi-Fi ever been considered for the buses? Um, I have personally tested with the, um, the the radio people and using one of our staff members back in the office and we did go out and do test areas where, where there was a problem and had very good success with it. And that was actually not even using it to the full potential I'm, I'm looking to use it for. Um, so as far as coverage, that won't be a problem. Um, we have not pursued any Wi-Fi connection only because Wi-Fi in a vehicle requires a cell phone signal. And also that would be about $30, <laughs> give or take. That was a Google search I did. It's about $30 per vehicle to have Wi-Fi on that vehicle. So that would be, and that's per month. So we have roughly 14 buses. You're looking at $30 per bus. With the radios, it's a one-time purchase. We're, we're done. I pay a small licensing fee um, to the, uh, um, one of the state agencies. And outside of that, there, there's no more cost after this. We're, we're up to date and actually gone past um, most, most other companies. Uh, bus engine repairs. What did the three turbo diesel engines cost us when it went bad? Are there no warranties on these buses, bumper to bumper warranties? Are we buying extended warranties? Uh, the approximate repair cost was $8,223.88 uh, to have the bus repairs done. That is a bill that comes to us from the Public Works Department. Our, our buses are repaired over at the Public Works building at the town garage. Um, we do purchase extended coverage. However, the age of this bus, the age of the average age of our buses are about six years old, and that falls just outside of the warranty period. Um, I, and actually, I believe that the three that we're speaking of in particular are even <coughs> older than that. But for just as a ballpark figure, we're looking at about six years average for our buses. Um, but we do cover it with warranties. <coughs> middle school office additions. The construction of two middle school offices, is that taking student space? How much is that space utilized or underutilized? And will alternative space be given to the students? 
Um, these, these are just sitting areas, two sitting areas in the middle school that I don't, I think they get used very, very little. I, I've personally never seen anybody in them, um, but that, that is also why we came to this conclusion that these would be the two perfect spaces to put a, a offices into. So there, there is no, we're not, we're not taking any student space away and therefore there is no alternative space being figured in for students to go to. For the most part, it's a hallway. Um, the Pond Cove entrance. Are there existing doors or could we add some to close off the lobby from parts of the school, including the gym and cafeterium, cafetorium, and have another camera entry point just prior to the sec secretary window and eliminate the need for hiring a receptionist? Um, in the Pond Cove, we can definitely do that because there is already a set of doors separating the cafetorium um, from Pond Cove's main entrance and then put another set of doors on the opposing side. The only thing is it would be, it would be about, a, I'm estimating about a $35,000 project and that would be about 25,000 for it to build the wall and, and, and put in the doors, but then to put in a camera and electronic locks so that they could be operated by somebody at the, at the desk. Um, you're looking at about a $35,000 project and we're still left with an issue at the middle school. It, it, only, it only helps Pond Cove if we were to do it this way. Um, there would still be a travel distance from Pond Cove to the, the middle school as far as going past the cafetorium or entering the front entryway there. Um, the idea behind having a, a separate person was so that uh, parents could come into the building and be either be escorted or guided from that particular person after they've entered the building. Uh, the bus driver shortage. Uh, have you ever offered training for those teachers on the way to retire or retired or staff who may be interested in this post? This can go a long way, especially if the teacher or staff been with the school for system for school system for a long time. First of all, I'm super happy to say in the past week we've had three solid people put in for the particular position we have had available all all year long. So, <laughs> and uh, all three candidates. Top-notch, currently bus drivers, other places. One is looking to move down here and is looking for these exact hours. So um, I think that is going to be turning around very, very shortly. Uh, we, we have not done any formal posting to any staff member. We do currently have a middle school teacher who drives for us as well. Um, probably couldn't do it without him. But... Um, uh, the only thing that I have against, um, a lot of schools are doing in some type of incentive, a thousand dollar sign on bonus or they'll provide training. And what's happening is those people are taking that and if there's not some type of formal contract, they're taking their 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 skills now or their, or their money and they're going to other schools that are more convenient for them. So <clears throat> because we're on a cape, you know, it's, it's, a little bit of a challenge that if the person doesn't live here in town, it's not as convenient to them um, because everybody's hiring. South Portland, Portland, Scarborough, uh, you can pretty much go anywhere and be a bus driver these days. So I just, I haven't put it out there to staff, but we, we certainly could. Uh, the middle school nurses sink. Forty-five thousand dollars extra uh, for an extra sink in the nursing room seems to be expensive, in my opinion. Do we not have a plumber on our staff? We do not have a plumber, a licensed plumber, on our staff. We have four um, jack of all trades. Uh, they pretty much have to handle anything from electricity, locks, carpentry, y you name it. Um, this type of job can involve some work in an existing concrete floor, possibly going into a wall. It's, we haven't picked a solid location yet. There's two locations that uh, we're, we're trying to decide. Both are not real convenient, but um, 
that is the reason for the, the, the price. That is for the plumber to come in and do the work uh, for the drain, the water lines, and the actual purchase of the sink and mounting it. Um, water lines are typically easy. They can come from above. It's the drain when you're dealing with a concrete floor and there's nothing below it. School locks. Now what are the existing mechanisms question. for locking down classrooms in case of an emergency? Each classroom is equipped with a class one heavy duty lock is approximately about $400. In some locations, a bar has been fabricated to assist the standard classroom lock. I know that is the case in the high school. I'm not sure if that has gone over into the other schools or not. Um, I have safety concerns with some of our other buildings that I don't really would like to have on YouTube, um, but something I could address. <laughs> um, it, it'll, it'll be addressed if, if we do the study and have that work done. That'll definitely be included. It'll be something I'll talk to the architectural engineers about to bring to their attention. Before you move on to your next item, I think Nasser yeah, had I a just, question. Because we are on camera, I want to make a correction. I think you said 45,000 is 4,500, right? 4,500, yes, I'm sorry. Just correct that, yeah. yeah that That's is correct, $4,500. 45,000 would be an impressive sink. <laughs> really nice sink. Yeah. All right, the sand. Everybody's favorite topic. You can't escape it in this town. The board has heard many times that sand is a major issue in the buildings during the winter. Do you have any thoughts on what you what might be used instead of the instead or is the sand the best solution for treating walkways in the winter? It is my opinion that I would choose salt, um, and and that's. This is not the only area that I've worked in that has a sand issue, and I've told other school boards, as long as you have sand in the parking lot, you will not have clean buildings. Um, and I use, I use the concept of, if anybody's ever rented another person's beach house, um, they typically have showers or something or tell you not to wear your shoes in the house. And the whole reason is, once the sand gets into the place, it's tough to get out. And um, so uh, the, the amount of wear and tear that sand puts on our floors, um, you, you'll take a brand new polished floor and just wipe it out within a matter of days with the sand and the wear and tear on the equipment from the, the vacuums and things pulling up the equipment. I've seen the bottom of vacuums just completely lose the metal plate just from that constant going all over the floor. And it's like going over sandpaper after a while. So. My choice, I know it's a more expensive choice than sand, but salt would definitely solve a lot of problems. Uh, the high school stage, will patching, sanding, and repainting the stage floor in the high school theater serve as a long-term fix? The answer is yes. The, uh, the floor is in very good shape. Um, <coughs> otherwise, it, it, has, it has this, it, it was called a hole. It's not really whole, it's an indentation. That can have a repair done to it. The thickness of the floor, I believe, is the original floor. So there is still plenty of sanding that we can do on that floor before it will ever need to be replaced. Building heat. Are the erratic heat and cold issues in the buildings being addressed in this budget? I, 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 know, I know people chatter um, about too cold, too hot. I can tell you what comes through my office, there, there is no ongoing heating and cooling problem. If we have something, it is typically addressed immediately that day, if not, you know, the following day, depending on the situation. Um, a lot of this could stem from you know, somebody in this room could feel this room's warm. The next person sitting next to you could feel it's cold. It's just the nature of the beast. There are guidelines by the Department of Ed. I don't know them off the top of my head, but I believe it's somewhere in a range from like 65 to 75 degrees is what they require for us to fall into. Anything outside of that does not become a, an environment conducive to learning. Um, so we, we do whatever we can to, to uh, 
meet that goal. Um, if, if we can't fix it in-house, then a service person's called and it's handled that way. Um, but also having said that, throughout the schools and the town, um, our software system, our energy management system that drives the heating and cooling and also the uh, uh, parking lot lights is coming to the end of its life. I, I say it's kind of like Windows 95. It's no longer supported. Um, once, once it crashes and burns, there's no coming back. You're, you're gonna be hit with an expense. Um, to do the schools in the future, and this would also be put into a facilities report, would be roughly around $800,000. <laughs> and that is to, they basically come in and redo all the controls. Um, I had given the town manager some other quotes as well with town buildings. We're all facing it uh, throughout. Prioritizing the CIP list. Do you have a priority list of projects with the likelihood that we cannot do everything we want to do? For instance, what level of priority is flooring in the administrative offices given that <clears throat> given that we may have renovations within the next five years and those offices may be re relocated. And I'm just putting the priority right now on aesthetics being the lowest. General maintenance is just keeping up with things that could eventually give us a problem in the next following school year, being a medium priority. And then um, any type of needed repair, something that has to happen, uh, or any type of safety concern, it would be the highest priority, and that's how I would just break it out. Um, that's it. Do I have any other questions? Are there any further questions? It was kind of fast. But <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, ready to go with improvement of instruction. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I only have three questions to answer, so this should be quick. Although I'm happy to answer more if you have more. Um, so my first question was, at, CE, at the middle school and the high school, there is a reduction in state-mandated certification mentors. Why do we need fewer? Does this fluctuate? And the answer is yes, it fluctuates. The state requires us to um, support teachers who are brand new to the district. And this, in this 2018-2019 school year, we're supporting nine uh, new teachers, and we anticipate, based on projections, we're only going to need to support five, and so that's the difference in that amount. The second question is, what sort of flexibility and or contingency do we have built in when we have unpredicted fluctuations in ELL students? And this is always tricky. Um, if we were in a situation, so currently we, um, we have a 0.8 FTE ELL teacher, if we were to have um, enough new English language, learner, English language learners move into the district that we were gonna need to increase um, her service time, then we would begin by looking at um, places where perhaps for a variety of reasons we over budgeted and we would pull from those um, and if worse came to worse we would look to our contingency. And then the last question is do we have adequate PD funds, professional development funds designated? Uh, I think that we do. Um, we support two different kinds of professional development. There's the individual professional development, so the teacher wants to go to a workshop or a conference that he or she believes will improve their practice. And this year, as in the past, we have a set aside $350 for each teacher, and that would include the cost of the workshop or conference and also their travel expenses. And uh, sometimes a teacher wants to pursue professional development that costs more than that, um, but not everybody, and we're able to support that because not every teacher accesses the money that we've set aside. It seems to be working. We spend down that line every year, but we don't overspend. And the other kind of professional development that we support is um, hiring uh, school-wide professional development, so hiring experts to come in and talk to our staff about 
um, best practices in literacy and math, in uh, standards-based instruction, and those we are able to fund through the uh, money we get from the federal federal government, the Title II money, and we get approximately $45,000 a year. And that's also a backup fund in the event that were our individual PD lines to be spent down, we would have a little bit there to consider to use for teachers. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move on to the office of the superintendent. Okay, I have some questions. Um, number one, I understand that Superintendent Coulter brought forward the 0.5 administrative nurse assistant as a district-wide position to support all three nurses. However, that is not a part of the office of the superintendent's budget, is it? Um, who supervises this person and where do where does his or her salary and benefits reside? That is, within which section of the budget does the position live? Uh, where does he or she physically work? And has the job description changed to include actual nursing duties? So the salary is split between all three schools. Um, it's under the uh, secretary to health in the health services area. The person does work in all three schools, and um, they have developed a schedule. Uh, the nurse, she, it's, a, it's a woman, she has worked with the, the um, nurses to develop a schedule, and um, it hasn't really been clear about supervision, but that would rest at this point um, at the, um, with, the, with the principals who um, also um, would work with the nurses and supervising because this person works so closely uh, with the nurses. Um, the, job, uh, the job description and qualifications would change based on the needs of the position. Uh, so that sort of goes with the second question. It is reasonable that this assistant would need a higher level of medical training than the average layperson in order to be highly efficient. Would requiring this person to, to be held, this position to be held by an LPN be budget neutral or similar to the cost of the current position? And the nurses have discovered this year that um, a certain amount of medical training would be more helpful uh, to them. Um, we have done some research on uh, what an LPN, the cost would be for an LPN um, in uh, talking with other budgets, uh, other districts, and it would be budget neutral um, based on that research. So number three, you have mentioned that there will need to be staffing reductions due to enrollment changes at Pond Cove. Please give us an update on that situation given retirements and any new enrollment data. Um, so the latest enrollment data would be a projected 99 students for next year. Um, in that particular grade level in the fourth grade. Um, in the school overall, there have, has been one retirement for next year. Um, there is one teacher coming back from a leave. Uh, one teacher will replace a teacher who was hired on a one-year contract. We have um, two probationary teachers, and they would each uh, retain their positions. So it would just be the, the one teacher who was hired on a one-year uh, contract last year, the kindergarten teacher. Um, given the information, uh, the informative uh, presentation by MEABT at our February 12th business meeting, do we have anyone that tracks the number of participants in the wellness incentive programs the MEABT rep mentioned? How might the school department assist in spreading this information and encouraging staff to participate? So, um, Arlene, our human resources person, coordinator, is the ambassador for the wellness program through the MEABT. She attends the annual meeting uh, with, with the MEABT to review, discuss, and learn more about the wellness program. She's responsible for promoting one challenge per year. Um, they do give the school department $500 per year for promoting the program and for doing the challenge. Uh, so this year, and this, this came from Arlene, this year we are paying for yoga classes offered to our employees with the $500 stipend. 
Arlene receives newsletters from the MEABT on a regular basis, usually monthly. She forwards the newsletters to all of our employees. The newsletters promote healthy eating, exercise, etc. The MEABT tracks the number of participants per district that participate in the Wellness Incentive Program. Uh, it's called On Life. The On Life Health Wellness Program is only for employees, retirees, spouses, and domestic partners that are covered under the MEABT Health Insurance. So there are quite a few programs that people can participate in, and they offer gift cards if you um, do a certain amount of exercising and um, get a wellness check and do those things. You, you turn it in. You can hook your Fitbit up to the... Um, the computer program and it tracks your steps. So, um, and then uh, you can get gift cards based on the work that you do. So, so there's a lot. There is a lot going on, and Arlene does oversee that. Uh, please explain the fiscal impact of the state's wish to move the CDS preschool children into public schools for their special services, space staffing, programming. If this shift is not fully funding, what would this mean for our district? Should we keep this in mind as we discuss the needs assessment and room space in our buildings? Um, boy, that is a question that I wish I could answer. Uh, we have not heard anything um, for sure about what is going on in CDS. I know Dell's monitoring that closely at the meetings that he goes to. It's a hot topic. The, meeting I, the meetings I go to, it's a hot topic. And we just aren't hearing anything um, specific or uh, anything that, that, that we can uh, really uh, hang our hat on that's coming out of Augusta. Uh, so I think we're, we're in the waiting mode at this point. Um, I heard at a recent meeting that they're probably not going to be doing, able to do anything because we're all in budget season at this point and um, some districts are putting some funding in for planning. Um, some some districts are not. Um, we at this point don't have any any money uh, in in for that. I I don't think it's going to hit us next year. I think they're going to have to give us more time um, at this point. But you never know. Um, thinking about uh, space and rooms in our buildings. Um, yes, this probably will impact us. Um, we will have little ones coming. This doesn't mean we have to run a pre-K program um, or a three-year-old program, but it does mean that um, we will probably need to find spaces to provide services for, for students. Not all three- and four-year-olds, but some uh, three- and four-year-olds. So, um, yes, we, we would need to take into consideration staffing and space. Um, if we have to provide um, for these services for these students, speech, OT, PT, um, it will impact our staffing. We will definitely have to increase staffing. And again, we haven't heard if there's any money coming out of Augusta. Have you heard anything more, Del? No. no. Just that some districts are trying to, I guess, take steps because many of the, the groups in Cumberland County at least don't have the preschool. So they have some districts in the outlying areas where they've seen their numbers drop, where they actually had physical space and started preschools. And those folks that have the preschools are starting to have started servicing some of those students as well. But it's it's a lot easier when they're already there. Than in the so stay tuned for that. Um, please explain why the insurance liability costs for the school board have gone up by 46 percent. Um, uh, this is based on our experience and our use of um, our liability insurance and recently in the past two years there have been some um, legal actions um, which have resulted in an increase in our legal liability insurance. It's like your insurance at home if you uh, if you use it, often your rates go up, and that's exactly what happens. Um, all legal liability is under the school board line, including special ed. Why do we need to increase uh, account line 9001-3000 by so much? Is this the cost for the strategic planning facilitator? It seems that we will not need it next year. Um, the funding would not be for the facilitator. That is a one-time occurrence. Um, it would co cover people we uh, bring in for trainings. We're required by the state to do more and more trainings. This year we had um, two attorneys from Drummond and Woodson come in the beginning of the year and um, 
do a, um, some trainings for our teachers all at once. Um, it would include some uh, food for joint meetings that we had, uh, the joint meetings with the town council, and um, it would pay for the food. Uh, conferences for school board members, and the school board had a retreat this year um, that was for a few hours um, off campus. Uh, so it would pay for that, and uh, there was there was very little money in there before, so um, there is an increase, um, and that really covers that. So. Any other questions? Further questions for Dr. Wolfer? Uh, I have a question on the um, the projected enrollments. Is there an update on the kindergarten registration numbers? What we have coming in. in the I have not heard an update on that, Jason. We were at seventy-five, I believe, less. So we are over eighty now. Pardon me. Over eighty. Over eighty. Last time I checked, over eighty. We've we've had our detectives out searching for <laughs> for students, so there has been um, a little activity in trying to make sure that we get everybody. So. No, sir. So, related question to that, I guess I was going to ask later, but uh, do we take into consideration of the subdivision that's taking place, like Spurwink area and other places in town, when they can come about and the expected population that can move in there? That will help us identify the projection of the students and families? Yeah, I, I am not aware of Do we do that enough? Yeah, we, we have not. Okay. Any further questions? All right, moving on to technology. I have uh, received no additional questions at this time to answer, but I'm open to if you have questions now, answer whatever. I believe the only question the board had originally was around the website, and we have had plenty of had discussions. We've had discussion. The only other thing is to add to what um, the only question to add to Perry what we did last time when the power was out at the middle school. Um, I asked the um, fire chief to borrow the forester truck and use the generator off the forester truck and ran a, a hundred foot extension cord into the middle school to uh, make the power go on the network. I, I'm just curious, a, a follow-up about, um, so the internet at the library, is, is the internet at the um, emergency services building affected at all? When the internet at the library is, is tied into the school network. That's correct. Okay. And what about um, police and fire stations? Police and fire are tied into this building. Okay, but we do have a router there in the middle school that uh, affects some of the land. Okay. I just, I just want to add one thing. It's not a, a question. Um, one thing when I was talking about the website that although the $15,000 to get it going, um, the, one of the hopes and goals would be in addition to improving the overall experience of using our website would be to free up Noel and his, um, his colleagues to do more of what they're hired to do. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions? Yeah. So while you're up there, uh, I guess I can ask about the website. Uh, is this going to curtail anything that where the teachers are going to have to do more learning curve of putting the, the information on their websites? Oh, is it going to be a totally different platform for them? They'll probably be totally different. There'll probably be a learning curve on it. Um, it's like, and any new technology, there's always a learning curve. There's always a, that type of uh, and, uh, beginning that people are a little bit nervous about it and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the website's not purely design-based. It's more than that. It's actually getting the materials up there for, from students, from teachers, and so forth. Right. Okay. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so I'd just like to thank all department heads and administrators. Um, I know that um, we gathered lots and lots of questions. Some people had a, a 
lot, a lot of questions. But um, thank you to everybody for your research and time and getting those, those answers back to us. We really appreciate your thoroughness and um, the time you took to give us those. Um, there may be more questions coming your way, so stay tuned. And at this time, we're going to move on to some staffing and enrollment updates. So if you go to your packets, I'll just um, walk you through some information that is in there. Um, the, the next page that we should, um, you should find is the Pond Cove Elementary School projected enrollment um, for FY20 as well as the middle school projected enrollment. And this is broken down into um, grade levels. Um, of course, kindergarten is a projection. Um, and we just used the same number as um, that was in this, the kindergarten this year. Um, uh, and you'll see the average students uh, per class. And this is just based on taking that total number and divided it by the number of classrooms, um, as well as uh, the middle school. So that just is um, a projection of what next year will look like as far as our enrollment and number of classrooms. Is the, is the kindergarten number the 80s, actually? Is that what we were discussing before? Yeah, it, it stands at 80 now, Jason said, and okay. we're projecting, we're just, you know, projecting 111. It's just a projection. Sorry. Right. Got it. If you can speak, I'm looking at grades seven and eight, uh, and maybe I could do a little math and figure this out more. Maybe this is for Troy, uh, but next year, grade seven is 117 students, so the least amount of students with the most number of classrooms and the lowest average per class, and then the eighth grade is going to be the largest with six. It, yeah, I think, I'm wondering if you can just explain it. I think it's really simple. I think the seven should go where the six is and the six should go where the seven is. I think right now we have seven teachers in the seventh grade. Okay. Share, oh. But it's not moving that seventh grade teacher, that extra teacher up with that grade. Okay. So I think so that will shift. Six, six, seven, and then on the right hand side, seventh grade it looks like it would be 20 students that way. Yep. Eighth grade it looks like it would be 21. Okay. That makes more sense to me. Thanks. So. So, no, yeah, similar question that I saw on the kindergarten elementary school. So second grade is 86 students. When the rules 86 students move, then the same amount of teachers, five teachers gonna receive 111 students from the first grade. Can you uh, repeat that? Yeah. So, I don't think I understand the question. Yeah, I think we were, um, I think the last meeting we had a workshop, the teachers were up there advocating for class sizes and uh, trying to hope for that they would not be, the producers would be not reduced. But I'm trying to highlight the fact that here, the, 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 the second grade students present are 80, uh, 86, but that's a projection. That's, that's, a projection. that's a projection for next year. Still projection, okay. So how can that be projection? Because we're thinking of, of losing families from, from Cape Elizabeth? I believe that it's, must be current. It's, it's, so it's based grade. on our current first grade. Okay. And so next year those students would be okay, second so, graders. Okay, that makes sense then. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to ask. Um, I know that it is very difficult to do um, comparisons between uh, school districts, especially at the, uh, well, it's very difficult at the elementary and the middle level, especially when you're talking about some school districts have um, a K-2 building, and then they might have a 3-4 building, and then, you know, and some people have a 3-5 building, and then do seven, uh, 6, 7, and 8, and we do 5, 6, 7, and 8, and that sort of thing. Um, so I know that there have been requests 
um, for discussion about not only just looking at our um, staffing enrollment in, um, in comparison to the EPS formula, which we can do, but also looking at comps the way we really can do at the high school level. It's, I think it's, it lends itself to that comparison a little easier. But are you willing to talk about that yes. a little bit? So if you go to um, the next page with the blue bar graph, um, you will see total numbers of um, teachers and um, pupils in the in our district and in the surrounding districts, um, and the the bar graph looks at the percentage over EPS for teachers. Um, and so this is the whole district. Now also in, uh, in your packet, you have um, some different EPS um, charts from different uh, communities, surrounding communities. I think it might be at the back of your packet. And it's at the packet that, the packet that we handed out tonight. And so you'll see there's a section one page and we have, um, we have Falmouth, Scarborough, South Portland, uh, RSU 51 and Yarmouth. It looks just like the EPS. Um, what it looks like. Oh. I think it's at the end. Okay, I see Falmouth, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, this is this is what we get to um, look at other other district. Well, we we can go on the website to look at other districts um, to try to compare. But actually, it doesn't break their numbers of teachers down into um, elementary. How many elementary teachers do they have? How many middle school teachers? How many high school teachers? Um, it just gives us a total number of teachers. So um, we've been we've been working with this this week, thinking that we could possibly use uh, these ED two seventy nine pages to find to do a comparison. And again, it just gives us the total. It's also um, broken down. It breaks it down um, the numbers down into pre K K one to five, grade one to five, grades six to eight, and then grades nine to twelve. Um, as you know, we don't have a one to five school. Um, and so we have a K to four school, and then we have a five to eight school. So in looking at um, trying to figure out the staffing, um, we just, we could not break it down to do a, a comparison with other districts. It just didn't work. You were um, given a, in your, um, in your pat in your budget book last week, you were given. Let me see if I can find it. I think believe it's under enrollment and staffing, and it, it's a um, it's a chart with yeah, it looks like this. It looks like this in the enrollment and staffing section. Mm -hmm. And it gives a breakdown of uh, the staffing at Pond Cove Middle School and High School um, for FY19 and FY20. And so it does give us some title, some um, totals of what our teachers are. So we were trying, for example, today, um, Troy and Jason and I were, were trying to figure out if you had to separate, for example, the art teacher into the Pond Cove one to five and then six to eight, how would that work? And it just, hmm. it just doesn't work. Um, to, and let alone try to do a comparison of other districts that have other, other setups for their elementary and middle schools. So uh, we, we looked at it a lot of different ways and just, um, we also looked at the report cards and Troy did some um, work with uh, the report cards the, that were published that compared our district with other districts. Again, the school configurations were totally different depending what town you were in. Um, but 
the state realized that there were some um, issues with the data and they actually took the website down so we couldn't even go back in. Um, Troy was able to, to get the report cards for some, some of the other middle schools uh, because Kyle Morey had taken some screenshots. So he was able to do some work with that. Um, but the data is, it, it's not on the website anymore. So we couldn't even go back to that. So um, it, was, it was quite frustrating. <laughs> Um, but the high schools are comparable, and I know that Jeff has given you um, a lot of data about that, and actually we did include in your packets um, some more of, the, of uh, Jeff's thoughts about uh, student-teacher ratios and class sizes um, and, and how that, that all works. And he gave you some uh, data last week about comparison. So mm -hmm. while we can look at the total number of teachers for our district, and that is our blue bar, the blue bar graph page, to actually break it down um, into the elementary school and the middle school are uh, really pretty impossible at this point. So um, we, we may end up with um, newer report cards. The, the state may publish newer report cards uh, I think we've, we've heard some whisperings about they might be coming, but we haven't gotten them yet, so. Hope, did you have a question? I was just gonna make a comment about, um, it is it's nearly impossible to sort of compare us pupil by pupil, teacher by teacher to other districts, but what's interesting is sort of comparing ourselves this year to last year, mm -hmm. and sort of, we're not, we're not necessarily competing with those schools as far as efficiency, we're competing with like, can we be more efficient? And my understanding is, based on tweaks we've made and sort of recategorizing to, to correct classifications, just little tweaks, what we did was we, we increased our funding based on the way we, we basically fine-tuned our, our compliance with EPS, even though it's not our guideline and it's just a, it's a baseline. Um, but also what's interesting to look at is the, um, Funding per pupil. So even though um, our funding per pupil is 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 the highest of all of these districts. So I mean, it's it, you may look at the like how, what percentage we have over teachers, but we've done something right in terms of the, the utilization of the of the formula to get our, our funding per pupil is eight thousand forty four. And if you look at each of these other districts, they're all under eight thousand. At any rate, my point is, it's more about like how can we make our approach to the formula better, not necessarily how do we align with what the other districts are doing. Thank you. Susan? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I think I just wanted to confirm this is all the schools in for Cape, all three schools? Yes, it's total. Which is how we get our data, so. Uh, which is how it's presented on the EPS. Uh, formulas in, in total. This is helpful, thank you. It is That's helpful. And I, I, I guess I just want to reiterate, it's not that um, the superintendent or the principals or the board shy away from the work of trying to figure out comps. It's just very, it's, it's difficult when the state information provided is, has flaws and then you know we're, then we don't have access to it and, and then when we even just try to you could just try making you know phone calls or that sort of thing but again I mean if you look at um, just Yarmouth for instance they have um, the yes school Yarmouth Elementary I believe is just like K1 or K2 and then they have a, like a 3-5 and then they have a 6-7 so it, it just makes that very difficult so I appreciate Hope's point at of um, you know, comparing ourselves to how have we been doing, what are we doing, and, and you know, as much as we can hold on to our um, philosophy for having, you know, a high standard of education, how can we also, you know, maximize the amount of money that we can eke out of that funding formula? And I, I believe that we've made some gains. I don't believe, it's a fact. <laughs> so thank you. So we'll continue to watch our numbers. 
and, um, and look at our, um, our our enrollment and our teacher numbers, you know, based on mm -hmm. the numbers of enrollment as we go through this process. No, I had a question. I think it was more uh, back to your discussion around the elementary school. Um, at this time, given retirements and that sort of thing, I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly that no, um, no FTE teachers will be um, lost. That's correct. So um, nobody, nobody with a regular teaching contract will That's correct. be losing a position. We did hire one person last year on a one-year contract, okay. and we will be, unfortunately, losing that person. Um, but no one else will. OK. OK. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments having to do with staffing and enrollment? at this time. Kimberly? Just to clarify, the, um, the current fourth grade class is 99, you said? Oh, going into fourth grade. The next year. Okay, that, that, yeah, yes. sorry. Yes. Thank Rising you for board. clarifying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Okay. So, kind of in the same realm, um, to kind of have a discussion and clarify for the, the public, really, and for the board, um, why we staff the way we do, and, and even why it may look like, and it is that we have a um, growing number of staff and, and either the, the same number or fewer students. Um, we're going to talk about um, government mandates. And at this time, I believe we have a pretty specific look at federal mandates. And Susanna has a very interesting handout. I hope you brought your cheaters. It's quite long. I'm going to hold it up for the television viewing audience <laughs> right here. Copies are being handed out. And I'm going to let Susanna talk about it a little bit. All I'm going to say about this is that it starts in 1900 and goes into the 2000s, and I have not count, counted how many mandates there are on here. But again, it's very fine print, and here's the list. So Donna Donna's going to talk about it, not Susanna. Donna's going to talk about it. Uh, so this was information that was handed out um, at the um, Maine School Board Association conference in October. Um, it, it, the research was done by a uh, well-renowned um, national speaker, and his name is uh, Jamie Vollmer. Um, and he started um, by, he's a proponent of public schools, and he's very concerned about all that public schools are asked to do. So he started doing some research on, uh, from 1900, all of the uh, federal mandates and programs that have been added to our plates um, since 1900. And it's quite an interesting list if you, um, if you read down it. And the interesting thing is that um, when people ask, you know, why does education cost so much? If you turn it on its side, um, it also shows a projection of the cost of education and how it's gone up as a result of um, many of these federal programs and mandates. And if you look in the 2000s, it's pretty incredible. Um, all of the 
programs and mandates that schools have been asked to address. And I'll, I'll just, for the people at home, um, read some of them. No Child Left Behind, Bullying Prevention Programs, Elevator and Escalator Safety Instruction, Body Mass Index Evaluation, Eating Disorder Counseling, Suicide Awareness, Steroid Abuse Prevention, Media Literacy, Expanded Early Childhood Wraparound Programs, Financial Literacy, Intruder Lockdown Training, Health and Wellness Programs, External Defibrillator Training, Leadership Training, Contextual Learning Development, Entrepreneurship entrepreneurial skill development, credit retrieval programs, mastery education, database decision making, increased graduation requirements, online learning requirements, race to the top, common core, STEM, allergic reaction monitoring, critical incident training, summer breakfast and lunch programs, weekend backpack programs, anti-harassment programs, courses on internet safety, date rape, organ donor awareness, texting and social media etiquette, the abandoned newborn protection act, tra child trafficking, domestic violence, job interview preparation, marijuana safety, cyberbullying, opiate addiction, distracted driving prevention, and anger management. Um, so these are uh, federal and uh, federal programs and mandates um, just in the 2000s. So you don't know that too. Pardon me? The number for people. Can you read out that number as well? Oh, um, and so cost. Yes, cost of education from um, 1900 per student. Uh, in the 1900 through 1910, $487 per student. Um, at the end of the 2000s, where we are now, um, th this is the average national cost per student, $14,594. So why, why has education, the cost of education um, increased? I, I, this is a pretty good explanation of that. Um, how has it impacted our district? So in, in your packet, um, you have uh, the implication, there's a, a page called the Implication of Federal Mandates Programs on Staffing in Cape Elizabeth Schools. Um, and as we sat down to look at our staffing and as I talked to the administrators, um, for example, Cape Elizabeth High School, um, one full-time speech, four special education teachers, two social workers, three full-time um, equivalent guidance counselors, one nurse, 1.4 music teachers, 1.7 art teachers, 0.4 OT, occupational therapy, uh, three health um, and PE teachers, a tech integrator um, slash computer programming teachers. So these are not classroom teachers and I didn't include um, foreign language teachers in here, uh, but uh, if you look down, you'll see um, where all of these people are and how, how many support people we do have in our schools. And so not only do we have to pay them, but we also have to find spaces for them. So there was a question earlier in the year about um, why, do we, why do we need so many spaces? And if, in our, if our enrollment is going down in schools, um, why, why do we need so many people and spaces? And this really um, shows uh, the, the staffing that we have on the back of the page is also the district-wide staff. Um, so you can get an idea of what we have district-wide. Uh, so we have a lot of support people in our district. Um, most of them are mandated. Um, we have to have these people. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? And they need spaces. Many of them need private spaces, confidential spaces. I think to that's work. important to highlight that they don't go into a busy, crowded classroom and right. perform a psychological examination, for instance. Right. 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 Susanna, I just I just want to add. Um, last year, I, I was really hoping to give this to one of our um, frequent visitors, Bill Gross. Um, because one of our favorite discussions with him was, you know, when his kids were in school in the, in 2000, uh, they didn't, you know, late they, yeah. and they didn't, or late 90s, they um, didn't have all these teachers, and why can't we go back to that? And this really was going to be a, a good way to explain to him 
um, the difference that you know is mandated to us, and, and this is just uh, federal mandates. It doesn't include special education. It does, or it doesn't include state um, mandates. Right. Oh. Laura, what's the time frame on this? Like you said, Bill Gross would say in the '90s. Like over the course of how many years have these programs that we listed out? What would you say? I, it's probably hard with the. I imagine they follow follow this yeah, trend. Follow so the over the past maybe as since the 2000s, you would say, early 2000s. Um, well, the, all of the special ed um, right. laws were um, before them, so it's well hard before them. So yeah. And I think if you look on that chart, you'll, you'll you can match see the, up. the date. Yeah. 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 With the, the, um, the IDEA laws and then the revision of those laws. Mm -hmm. um, and we have recently um, the RTI uh, requirements for response to intervention. So that required um, a whole new, and that's been in the last 10 years, a whole new level of support for our students. Yeah. It's I all, would it's imagine, all, too, that the... Um, more recent um, focus locally and um, on a statewide and, and national level around mental health and um, different, you know, bullying and the suicide and all sorts of different um, issues that, that schools are really trying to tackle. You, we've seen in, we've definitely seen an increase in guidance counselors, social workers, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we do need supports for our students. So. We do. Thank you for um, not only bringing these, because I think it's visually um, stunning to, to just see it listed out, but thank you, Donna, for um, pulling this information together, you know, district-wide and school by school. Um, I think the board has always believed that we've needed the staff and, and we've wanted to be able to have that conversation with uh, town councilors and um, community members like Bill Gross, very well-meaning people who just couldn't quite understand. And and we've always wanted to, we, we need these people. Things have changed and we keep saying things have changed and we, we can have some very tangible um, information now to share with people just on the federal side. This is how things have changed. So thank you very much, Susanna and Donna, for bringing this information. I had to go back home to get it. That's why I left for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on um, mandates and how we staff our schools? I'm struggling to find my agenda at this point with all my... So additional <laughs> updates? <laughs> yes, okay. additional updates. Thank you. So you also have in your packet a new pie chart. Um, and um, Catherine has nicely put at the bottom of all of these pieces the tabs that they should go under. So when you go to file your um, this this new packet in your notebooks, you'll know where to put where to put them or the suggested places to put them. Um, so we were looking at um, just the increase um, in the budget that has been proposed. Uh, that is the um, 7.8 increase, which we are working on, but uh, we're just looking at the proposed budget and the increases. So this pie chart shows um, where the increases um, stand at this point. Uh, so we have the big pieces, what the current salaries and benefits um, would be by, by the negotiated agreement just moving forward. Um, then we have the new position proposals that have been proposed at the, uh, the last several meetings. Uh, new equipment proposals, professional contracted services, fa faculty and maintenance utilities, and these are all increases over the FY19 budget. And then the fa facilities needs assessment is in there as a 10% as a piece of that um, increase. So just to give a visual of um, what, what the increases look like. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to the next page, salary and benefit comparison, um, we did further look at um, taking into consideration retirements um, and resignations. 
And we've, we've been talking about the 4.33 4 uh, if we just roll um, the staff that we have now um, considering the um, impact of increased salaries and benefits for next year. It, we were talking 4.33. So actually looking at it, at it again, um, it is a 4.2%. 4 um, so just um, for your information on that. So the 4.33 is gone and we're talking 4.2% now. Um, and based on some questions of um, the last budget meeting, if you look at the lower part of that page, you'll see that, um, so right now we, we are at a, an expenditure increase of 7.8% and it is a 7% um, increase on the tax. Um, so taking it down, if um, the first line is what, what will we were requested to do at the last budget meeting, take the bu budget expenditure increase um, down to 6% and that would be a 5.1% um, increase. In the tax in taxes, and that would um, be an amount of a reduction of four hundred forty nine thousand six hundred and eight dollars, and we are working on that, on that currently, and are almost there. Um, the administrators have been working on that, and still are there are still some things under discussion, but we're working hard on that. Um, if we took it down even farther, down to a 5.8%, it would be a 4.9% tax increase um, with a budget reduction of $500,393. And if we took it down even farther than that to 5.5%, it would be a 4.5% tax increase um, with a budget reduction amount of $576,570, just to see um, what we're looking at here as we think about reducing the budget. So as you're having these conversations, I'm hopeful that um, with the conversation that Perry will be having, that that isn't necessarily a cut around um, the generator, but you know the possibility of a cost savings. So hopefully that can be built in there because that could be significant. It's always changing. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then um, the next page, um, we call this Hope's Request. <laughs> Just because we got so confused about what we were talking about, we decided to, okay, let's call this Hope Re Hope's Request. So at the top you'll see Hope's Request and we all know what that means. So at the last meeting, um, Hope was talking about what would it look like if we took out all of the um, new proposals and just went back to um, looking at the increase in that we have to um, give in salaries and benefits. Um, and again, right now we have a 10% increase in benefits. We're still waiting. We won't know um, until April about what our increase is. Um, so um, Catherine took these, these numbers and, and took out um, most of the proposals uh, that were in here. Um, the health, well, I'm not gonna read through them, but um, these were the, the positions that were proposed. Um, took out the John Deere Gator, sorry, Jeff. And <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is just looking at these numbers. Took away the, the uh, radios, but these were basically the new, um, the new programs, the new equipment, the new um, positions that were proposed. And so uh, that added up to uh, a total of $264,656, uh, sorry, 264656 yes, dollars. Um, and uh, took us down to a 6.7% um, increase in the expenditure budget with a 5.9% tax increase. Um, then um, we took out the facilities needs assessment just to see what it looked like. Um, and that took us down to the 6% um, and with a 5.1% um, tax increase. So, um, so this was just, this was done just to satisfy your curiosity of what this would look like. Um, this is also with, uh, I know there was, uh, some concern about um, Perry bringing back his budget um, because there had been some serious um, 
eliminations last year. And so him, Perry bringing back his budget as well as um, the principals bringing back their um, equipment and supplies to restore restore them back. They have actually done that in, in the budget. Um, and we talked about that yesterday as well. So, um, so that's what this is, that's what this would look like. Um, so as an exercise, this didn't. It was an exercise. There, yeah, it was an exercise. It didn't really place a lot of priority on anything. It was just. Right. Yeah. Right. It was just to answer the, I wonder what it would look like if. And so that's, that's what it would look like. Keep wondering, Hope. We know more thoughts. Um, also in your packet you had, and it was back a few, but I just want to mention it. Um, in our discussions, um, and I, I know that Troy brought this up um, about the increase in the, in the French position at the middle school. And so we have formalized that by um, including a position proposal um, for that. And uh, to bring that up to a 0.875, uh, from a 0.75, it would be an increase in $11,533. So that would, um, that would go in your... Um, new program position mm -hmm. proposals. Um, at this point, it, it does not sit in the budget. Uh, it has not been put in, uh, as well as the uh, website has not been put in. But we are, we are working on that as we look at um, the reductions that we were asked to make. So. Understanding that our next budget workshop isn't until Tuesday, March 26th, and um, so that feels like a long time between now it and does, then. It does. We, I think we felt as an administrative group that maybe we would want to share our work with you before then. Was there a possibility of that happening at, a, at the, the business meeting? Or would you like to add a? I think we should go and add a separate evening. Okay. There is another Tuesday, I believe. But, um, we could do it on a Thursday yeah, I think or we, the following mm -hmm. Tuesday. Yeah, so I'll just to Tuesday myself. There, Quickly. So that feels like a lot. We could, so we could do it on the 19th, mm -hmm. um, or if you want it sooner, we could do it on the 14th, which is a Thursday. There's a high school band and chorus concert that night. Which one? The 14th. So Jeff and I will be there. <laughs> Is the 19th feel soon enough or? I think so. It's the first Tuesday after the business meeting. Mm -hmm. I casually had it on my calendar anyway, so. <laughs> okay. Tuesday we'll night. Yep. We can, we will update the uh, location. Yeah, we'll have to yes. have a location and update the uh, budget calendar. Yes. But I agree, I feel like we need to get together and have conversations sooner rather than later. So is this an additional meeting? So the 26th will still happen? Yes. It? Yes. Yeah. It's budget season. We get to see a lot of each other. It's really nice. Okay. So I'm going to update my little speech here then, and change it to the 19th. Um, so are there any further comments from the board at this time or questions? At this time, I'd like to uh, open the floor to questions and comments from the public on budget items.
Thank you for following protocol, Wynn. <laughs> Just put your name. Uh, you can put your name. We know where you are. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on a couple of things, and I don't know how important they really are. I mean, they're kind of important. I, I did hear uh, um, Perry talk about radios, and I can speak to that as a, believe it or not, a former truck driver um, who used radios, and uh, they really are much more efficient, I would think, than cell phones, so that uh, I can back that up. Um, the other thing is the wellness program. I will say that the wellness program is, uh, you know, we get emails all the time uh, as teachers. I think that we could probably do a better job of getting more teachers to participate in it. I've, I've participated in it. I, I stopped entering my my time, although I, I, I swear I exercise all the time, but uh, it became more of a burden to, to enter that information for me because I don't have a Fitbit. But uh, I think it's something that, uh, that uh, as the association president, we could probably do even a better job of promoting that. So we'll work on that. There was a question about the website and working with teachers and having them upload information. I think a lot of teachers use Google Classroom, and I don't know whether that's something that Noel can speak to. But uh, I don't know that the learning curve would be that big for people because uh, I don't think it's really something that, that people use as much. I think in terms of the state, um, I was glad that you brought up this stuff about the federal mandates. I think it's really important that we also remember the state mandates, which in, uh, take up an incredible amount of time and money. And I think we have to remember that many of those state mandates or, or almost you know any federal mandate or state mandate to me, a lot of them come uh, from, uh, in, a, in a way of helping to improve struggling and failing schools. And in the 18 years that I've been in Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth's never been looked at as a failing school district or a struggling school district. So I think we have to think about how we can go about um, meeting those state mandates and talking about those stand uh, state mandates in a much more efficient and, and cost-effective way. Because I think that we've uh, we spent a lot of money on professional development for those kinds of things, and we have to think: is that the way? Is that the best way to spend that money? Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> is there anybody else that would like to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, no, I, I think uh, you reminded them last time to prioritize since we looked at Hope's list. Do you want to remind them that it will be nice before our meeting yes. to have that? Yes. Okay. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, Hope made an interesting um, kind of proposition what would it look like if we if we just kind of tried to restore some things that had been cut out and and offered no new proposals and no new and that was sort of an exercise that um, the superintendent presented us with tonight it doesn't represent priorities or um, where people really feel the money should go it was just it was one it's it's important that we we kind of do our due diligence and that was kind of one look um, one discussion we had last week was um, what would it look like, and using using priorities this time, um, what would it look like if we reduced our spending to um, a 6% increase? And hoping for um, cost sharing opportunities as well as spending reductions, you know, if the, the administrators and department heads got together. So that was talked about last week, and um, I guess, the, the board needs to, um, I think, affirm that we want that work to be done or if we want the administrators to go further. I think the superintendent and the administrators need that direction. They need have, to have the time to do that work. Further than the six? Yeah, if, if, if anybody wanted to, to talk about going further than six at this time or just to see what it would look like to get to six, which would be a 5.1% tax impact, my understanding. And we've almost completed that work, so to get to six, so. 
So is the question to see whether we want to see further than six, if we want them to do the work further, are we interested in that? Mm -hmm. I would say I'm okay with the six. I don't see mm -hmm. going further than At that. At this point, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's an unpleasant question to ask, and I'm the, the person that has to ask it. So I'm asking it. I would agree, Nicola. I think um, we're going to learn a lot of what it looks like at 6%. Mm -hmm. and I'm scared to see what that is already. So I guess I would, I, I would tend to agree with that as well. Uh, is there time? if we were to meet again on the 19th and find out that information, to then ask for a greater cuts if we needed to look further. It would be tight, but we would do it. It's a good question. So I guess, um, I would like to stay with the six since they're six percent not and see how that looks and then potentially come back, hopefully not have to, but potentially. Instead of asking you to do that work right now, I'd like to see what the six looks like first. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's my opinion. And just to clarify, the six is not going to be necessarily what is no. Before us here, this was simply the things that were added new to the yes. budget this year. Thank you. Would anybody else like to weigh in on this topic? Well, um, when I asked the question earlier about prior to saying, I was thought you were going to ask the, the superintendents, not superintendent, the, the principals to prioritize their list so that can help us make hopes list that we saw earlier. I think that if, I, if I'm not speaking out of turn, I believe that's what they are doing okay. with the superintendent at this okay, time yeah, okay, and making good. their decisions. As long as they are doing that, yes. okay, good. Yes. My understanding. Yeah, I, just, I just haven't seen it just if they're no. doing right. that. And I can, I can only good, good. reiterate yet again that, that and I'm sorry, I, and maybe this feels like a heavy burden to hope, but it's the hopes list. It was an, it was, it was a really, it was an interesting question. It was an exercise. It doesn't represent the priorities of the, the principals and department heads. It was an exercise. And that they are, I, I'll let you speak for yourself too, but that the, the department heads and administrators are meeting with the superintendent, okay. have met, continue to meet to develop priorities um, and find, you know, cost savings and um, spending reductions. Hope. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, so in the list um, of the version one requested total budget under the HOPES request, which by the way is not something I'm an advocate of, it's just as an academic exercise that has my name on it now. <laughs> um, so I noticed that the um, removed <coughs> The computer programming teacher of the high school is, is a $35,000 decrease, but there was an 84K add-on in the original like, kind of budget changes. How, how did that number, how did we work out so that it, I kind of matched up all these numbers to what they had been added on, and that one just was the only one I couldn't reconcile. So what, what are you is, looking at? Is that the, is that at, the half time? I, I think it has to do with partial time. So it's it's hopes request. It says remove right. 0.4 FTE computer programming teacher reduction 35,000. Um, oh, that was okay. So it's the programming computer programming position. I, I'm still not. I'm not clear on that because. We'd added 84000 to the budget for the math and computer programming position. So is it now pulling out? So that was, that? A, that was a combined position. Okay. So we're just pulling, we were just pulling okay. out the combined computer. Position. Got it. Okay. The math position, yeah, is yep. already there. It already yeah. exists, yeah. I, if I understand correctly. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then my comment is I have no interest in going deeper than, than what's presented here. This is sort of the, this is all I would, I would play with this, what's here. And I don't see any need to go deeper than that. 
Thank you. Further questions or comments? Okay, it sounds like the will of the board to keep on working at a 6% spending increase. And will we be able to see that list before the 19th, like maybe a day or so before? Yes. Yep. Okay, that'd be great. It just to be able to study and prepare. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So closing tonight, looking ahead, our next budget workshop is on Tuesday, March 19th at 6.30 p.m. We don't know where yet, but we will let you know. Um, at that time, we will focus on any further budget questions and answers. Uh, the board will also discuss whatever the current version of the budget is at that time. Hopefully, we will be uh, looking at a... Um, 6% spending version and weigh the possible need for further cost savings or, or discuss where we're at at that time. Um, I'd like to thank all the presenters again. We really appreciate all the work. I'd like to thank business manager Catherine Mesmer, who hasn't necessarily done a lot of presenting, but has done a lot of the background work. And um, I appreciate all comments from the public, not just I, we. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to please submit your questions and comments via email. Um, at least a, we like to have a few days ahead of time, and please submit those questions to myself or Susanna so that we can compile, compile and condense those questions and then send them out to the appropriate people a few days in advance of the meeting so that those people have time to do the research and provide us with answers. Um, thank you again for being a part of the school board budget process, and good night. <laughs>